From your favorite dietitian, everything you need to digest in your mind. Tips, tips, tips with Tony. Tips, tips, tips with Tony. Making you healthier one bite at a time. Tips with Tony. Tips with Tony. Tips with Tony. Tips with Tony. Hello and welcome to the Tips with Tony podcast. I'm Tony Marinucci, your registered dietitian, helping you get healthy one bite at a time. Very excited for you to hear this next interview with the Jordan Syatt, who is someone very influential in the online nutrition and fitness space. And he does an excellent job representing how all foods can fit when you have the appropriate plan or mindset around it. He recently just did a Big Mac challenge. It was his own 30-day challenge, and he's going to tell you the details about it. But he basically ate a Big Mac every single day for 30 days and was still able to lose weight. However, you're going to learn the things that he came up against, the things that worked well and that didn't work well. I strongly encourage you to listen to this entire episode because not only are you going to learn about the Big Mac Challenge, which is so, so awesome, but he also has experience uh, experience training Gary Vaynerchuk. And if you don't know him, he's very popular in the online space. Um, he's kind of that person that kind of tells you the things that you don't want to hear, but you need to hear and really can be a motivating factor or a deterrent for some, however. Um, but anyways, the fact that he has been able to work with someone so influential and now himself has been so influential, um, it was really just an amazing opportunity and I feel very honored and humbled to be able to have the opportunity to learn from him and then to also learn about his experiencing working with Gary. Um, both of them are two, they're two people that I aspire to be similar to, not the same. And you'll learn all about how it's important to stay true to who you are. Um, if you really want to be successful in life and in business. Um, but in general, you're going to learn a lot. You are going to learn so much. It's a pretty lengthy episode, so I'm going to let you guys get right into it, and I'll catch you on the on the other side. Enjoy. Hi, Jordan. How are you? I'm well. How are you? I'm great. So excited to have you here. I can't tell you how many of my followers always are like tagging your stuff on Instagram and sharing things with me, and it's actually very refreshing to know that the people that are following my content are following somebody like you that puts out reliable information. So thank that you makes me for super that. Super happy. Thank you. I really yeah, that I'm so excited. So um, I ask this question to everybody that comes on, which is to explain who you are, what you do, and why you do what you do. Uh, all right. So who am I? Uh, I am a short, bald Harry Potter nerd. That's probably like the most three most important things. Uh, I like to lift weights. I'm really into fitness. I started when I was uh, I started when I was eight years old when I was wrestling. I started at eight years old, and basically I was obsessed with wrestling and girls for my entire childhood. Mm-hmm. And uh, when I got to high school, I made varsity as a freshman for wrestling, and that's when like strength and conditioning and nutrition really became a huge part of my life because I had to cut a lot of weight. I was yeah. cutting from 112 pounds to 103 pounds every week, sometimes several times a week, just to make weight. And uh, as a 14-year-old kid going up against the juniors and seniors, I was a good wrestler technically and endurance-wise, but strength-wise, I wasn't where the older kids were. So I started really getting into heavy lifting and trying to understand how do I get stronger while also losing weight at the same time, which then transferred a lot into my powerlifting career. Uh, and I powerlifted competitively for many years and uh, and then basically at, after high school, I took a year off. I lived in Israel for a year, came back after that. And basically I went, I went into exercise science at the beginning, but I realized very early on, number one, the teachers didn't know what the fuck they were talking about. It was mm-hmm. like really bad. Um, and number two is I had been interning at a gym since I was 14 years old. And I realized over that time that you could have the best program in the world. You could have the best nutrition guidelines in the world. You could have the best of the best of the best, but if people aren't following it, then they're not going to get results. So I ended up switching from exercise science to behavioral health psychology and really basically focusing on why people make the decisions they make in regard to their health. Why do people generally know what to do, but they're not doing it? Mm. And uh, how can I help that? How can I improve that? How can I get people to actually make the decisions that in their heart and in their mind they want to make but emotionally, it's actually very difficult to do. So I started my website when I was in my like sophomore year of college. 
without really an idea of a business. I didn't know it was going to, I didn't know PayPal existed. Literally it was just like, I want to write articles and help people. And, um, I did that all through college. And by the end, by the time I got out of college, I had a self-sustaining online coaching business. And, uh, then I moved back to Israel and I was there for a while. And then Gary Vaynerchuk's team found me and they were like, do you want to coach Gary? So I moved from Tel Aviv to New York and now here I am and you're in New York as well. And do our own podcast. Wow. So when, when do you coach Gary V? So I, coach was that? Him. I do still coach him now, but it's a little bit of a different situation. It was a three year deal, seven days a week, every single day from May 31st, 2016 until May 31st, 2019. So wow. wherever he was, I was, whether it was, if he was in Hong Kong, I was in Hong Kong. If he was in Germany, I was in Germany. If he was in LA, I was in LA seven days a week, no vacations every single day for three years straight. And then after that, I was like, I'm fucking burned out, dude. I can't do this anymore. Um, so basically, we came up with a deal where his coach prior to me and one of my best friends in the world, Mike Vacanti, he coaches him for three months and then I coach him for three months. And we go back and forth and we're on a, a one-year deal right now. I'm almost done with my first quarter. Um, and then I'll have one more and then I'll probably be finishing it out. Wow. Okay. So let's just like backtrack a bit. And um, and I honestly don't know. I know Gary Vee very well now, but three years ago, was he, and, and I don't even like, was, was he, did he have as big as like a following back then? Uh, I mean, he didn't have as big of a following. Like it's grown. So, I mean, I remember, I, it's funny. I remember when I was, we were doing a workout early on after I had started working with him and we were at the SLS hotel in Los Angeles mm -hmm. and we were looking at his Instagram and my Instagram had about 4,000 people on it at that time. And, uh, his Instagram had about 500,000 at that time. And I just remember he, he had in that session used, um, the 60 second club for the first time ever. Uh, and I don't know if you know what that is. Basically he did, he's, he, in that session was like, he was like, I got a great idea. He was like, if you, he told his audience, he was like, if you comment hashtag 60 second club within the first uh, 60 seconds of me posting, then you're immediately entered to win a FaceTime with me or like a t-shirt or whatever. And it blew up like it. And from that moment, his Instagram went from like 500,000 to like well over a million yeah. within a matter of months because the engagement just exploded from that. Mm -hmm. right? I'll, I'll always remember like early on, he had about 500,000. Now I think he has over 6 million on Instagram. So like, yeah, he's, he's exploded. Yeah. Well, cause I, then that's also like back then it's not saying like you, I'm sure your quality of work was the same. And obviously as we get older and we learn, we, we get better, but, um, I just think it's really cool that you guys kind of like grew together. Yeah. And, and I will say one of, I probably, probably the, the major benefit of being around Gary seven days a week for three years straight what a lot of people are like, well, did you learn any tactics? Like, did you learn any social media hacks? And like, Gary doesn't have any social media hacks. Yeah. He just himself. He talks about it all the time. He's, he's yeah. not lying. The, the, what the benefit was, was that I saw how hard I was working and I saw how hard I could work. Mm. And I, I thought that I was working hard before and I was working decently hard, but like not anywhere near where Gary was. And, and to to date, I don't think there's been a single day that I've worked as hard as Gary works on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah. Like it's a, it's insane. That's like, inspiring. That's it's, awesome. He's up at 5 a.m., 6 a.m. every day, goes all day, not every single second, every single second from the workout to the shower, to this travel, to like phone con, like everything, every minute, every single day. Um, but basically for me, the major thing that I learned was that even if I'm not working as hard as Gary, like I can still work way harder than I'm doing right now. And that carries over to a lot of aspects of life, whether it's fitness or nutrition or business or relationships. Like you don't have to be the pinnacle elite, but mm -hmm. just because you're not the pinnacle elite doesn't mean you can't like do better than you're doing. Yeah, for sure. Um, I think it's, what I'm like kind of thinking is he's so like his way of helping people create behavior change is so like in your face. Like he does it. I actually have someone coming on the podcast um, after you and recording um, and his, his method of like helping people is very similar. It's like, I don't BS, do the things <laughs> like that's it. But I think with you, it's like, you have a way of being honest, but not like pushy, not in your face. Like, and it's just funny. Like, how did you not 
pick that up from him? Like, how do you stay so true to who you are while being in someone's presence? That's like, so like you, I feel like if I were around him, I might pick some of that stuff up. Not that it's good or bad. It's just like what I would do. You know, I think, I think Gary realized that people were doing that with him in his content. For example, if you look, you can see how his message, the nuance has changed. So for example, um, one of his most famous messages is like, if, if you're looking forward to the weekend, like your shit's broken. Mm. And when he first put that out, he was really aggressive about it and he fully believed in it, but he got a lot of kickback too. And he was able to look at that kickback and be like, you know what? If you do look forward to the weekend and you're happy, that's fine. Then your shit's not broken. And so now he'll change the nuance. So like, listen, the issue is if you are not happy. And, and so I think the way that, I wasn't able, I wasn't like taking his persona onto myself is that he makes it very easy to be yourself Mm. and like to learn from him and to see how he does it as Gary, but not to try and make what I do the, like Gary, like as truly myself as I possibly can. Mm -hmm. Totally. Yeah. Okay. So let's now bring it back to you a little bit. So you started with, kind of training him and now you have your own business where you kind of always did. How were you able to balance like training him pretty much full time and then also doing what you do? I feel like you do a lot. So can you speak a little bit more about like what you do and how you balance it all? Uh, Yeah. So actually, so the, the only reason I actually got the job with Gary is because I had my own business first. Right. But like uh, the reason that they found me is because of an article I wrote in 2012 that uh, was about fixing posture and like how to be essentially like if you're sitting at a desk all day, different ways to sit at your desk that will help like improve your posture. Now, the funny thing about that article is it's one of my least popular articles ever. Like barely anybody saw it, barely anybody liked it. I look at it now. I'm like, this is shit. Like this is truly awful. Mm -hmm. I wrote it in 2012. And, but Gary's old coach, Mike found that article and he really loved it. And he asked a question on it. And I replied to his comment. Like I tried to reply to everybody and then three years later, he ended up becoming Gary's coach. And then after he continued to follow me throughout that time. And then when his, his job was up, he was like, I think I know a guy who would be a really good fit. Mm-hmm. And uh, so basically in terms of balance, I'll be the first one to say like, I don't have much balance. I actually, I just tweeted about this the other day. I was like, yeah. I think balance is massively overrated. Mm-hmm. And, and to the other side of the coin where other people are like, well, balance is like it just because it, the word is balance doesn't mean it has to be 50 50 and i think that's a fair point right. for some people balance might be 80 20 which like it's in which case that's great but i think issues the issues of, of balance lie in when you're trying to live up to other people's definition of balance where a lot of people are like well how do you have work-life balance it's like i'm gonna be very honest with you like i don't mm-hmm. i spend almost all of my time on on my work but I love it. Right. And it's like, that's what makes me really happy. In, in five years, I might want to spend less time on my work, but for now I'm living a very unbalanced lifestyle, but also super happy about it. Right. Yeah. I think that's the most important thing is that you need to be happy with what you do. Yeah. I mean, the definition the point- of that can look different for everyone. And it goes right into, that's what I talk about with diet. And I know you do as well. It's, it's always, it's, it's what matters to you. You have to individualize it to you. What are your goals? What's important to you? How do you make time for the things that light you up and make you happy? And that what that is looks different for everyone. So I'm very similar to you. Like I love working. So for me to work six, seven days a week, it's, not a big deal, but I also do love getting massages and like treating myself and like calming my energy in that way, but I'll still go back to work after. Like, <laughs> yeah, of course. And I think like, what's the point of living a life that others deem balanced mm-hmm. if you're not happy doing it? Right. I would rather live a life that others look at as unbalanced, but have be super happy with myself with what I'm yeah. doing. Yeah. Because everyone has a different definition of balance. And the reality is like, if people are looking at what you're doing and like judging you and saying, well, your life is very unbalanced. It's like, they have too much time on their hands. Like they should Mm -hmm. be focusing on themselves. So true. So true. Very, very true. All right. So let's, let's go into diet a little bit because you just did your own like self experiment 
um, you call it the Big Mac challenge, right? Yep. Do they know? Does McDonald's know? Um, I don't think so. I, I, I really wish they did. <laughs> I, I really wish they did because like, but then again, I mean, it's so funny. There were a number of people who were like, oh yeah, clearly McDonald's is sponsoring this. I'm like, you really think McDonald's is like, you think they give a fuck? Like they're doing great. Like they yeah. are doing fine without me. Um, but I never got contacted by them. I never, I, like never reached out. i never saw them like promote it at all. So if they do know about it, they don't really care. And uh, if they don't know about it, I'm, I would be, I'm not really surprised. Yeah. But it's kind of interesting though, because you're actually kind of other, um, opposite than the documentary, um, what was it? Super Size, Super Size Me? Super Size Me was kind of like putting McDonald's down, right? But actually your spin on it is like not so much, you're not really putting it down. So it would be, they would kind of be smart of them to look into it a little bit more um, and have you do what I think would be the first non-biased documentary ever on Netflix. <laughs> that would be amazing. Oh, and like, coming out with more and more biased. Yeah, yeah like, like that's a whole other podcast. But let's just, like, let me just, like, to my listeners. Guys, if you're listening to, if you watch any Netflix video or movie that tries to tell you that one way of eating is the right way, it's biased. Like, just stop. Just don't don't very, stop watching. Very narrative driven. Very very, but anyways, um, that would be awesome. We should get you on Netflix. <laughs> it was funny when it was launched. There were a lot of people tagging Netflix and being like, "Netflix, you should put this on there." Yeah, um, I think it goes directly against everything that either their investors are involved in or whatever. Like, I yeah. doubt. I mean, if they did, I would absolutely love it. Maybe um, Hulu. I don't know. Does Hulu do stuff like that? That's an interesting question. You know what? What I was sort of thinking was doing the idea of having like a, a show, a recurring series where like doing this on a recurring basis and going to different restaurants or going, doing different, either instead of maybe doing it with food one time, doing it with activity, like seeing the difference in like high intensity interval training versus low intensity. So like, and so doing all these, it's essentially addressing all the major fitness myths yeah. and like, instead of just taking out studies and like saying, well, look at this and taking other people's success stories, like being like, I'm going to do it. Yeah. I'm show you in real time how it works. Right, exactly. So, all right, so let's get into it. Explain to everybody, um, like, what made you want to do the challenge, um, what, 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 it, what was involved, and then the results. So, I'll say this. I, I'll preface by talking about the way that you phrased it, and I think you phrased it very well, because you said Super Size Me was basically putting down McDonald's, mm -hmm. and my Big Mac challenge was not putting it down. Mm -hmm. because it's a very important way to phrase it. It's not saying McDonald's is healthy. It's not saying Big Macs, you should be eating Big Macs as a nutritious part of your diet. Yeah. What I did was is I ate one Big Mac a day every day for 30 days as part of my diet. I, I included it. A lot of people hear that like you only had one Big Mac. It's like, no, I had one Big Mac and an overall regular diet that I normally eat, but I included one Big Mac every day because there's a lot of guilt and shame and anxiety around food. And there are people who they have, whether it's a Big Mac or where they have a slice of pizza at their daughter's uh, birthday party, or they have a slice of cake at their nephew's graduation ceremony, or God forbid, they have a fucking ice cream cone because they want some ice cream. They, they feel guilty about it. And they think they fucked up. And they think that like everything is ruined. And I wanted to show people that not only can you incorporate your favorite foods in moderation without losing progress, but you can actually do it while continuing to make progress. And over the course of the seven days, I, I lost seven pounds and I documented every single bite of every single Big Mac and every single weigh in. And uh, people lost their shit. Like they really went nuts about it. And it was by far the most time and effort I've spent on any single project. And it was by far the most rewarding to see how many people were messaging me, like literally thousands, like well over 3,500 individual messages just from basically being like, I've suffered with anxiety. I've suffered with food anxiety. I've suffered with anorexia, with bulimia, with binge eating disorder. And I've read everything you can imagine on dieting and nutrition and flexible dieting and all this stuff. But finally actually seeing you do it and eating a Big Mac every day is what made it click. Mm -hmm. And that makes the whole thing worth it. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. I think a lot of times people just want permission to know the foods that they can eat. Um, and because we are in a very diet restrictive mentality where 
all of these images are constantly telling you what you can't eat. Yes. And so a lot of people look up to you and the fact that you're saying, no, you can't eat this. If you also do this, which we're going to get to in a minute, then I think it helps relieve some of that anxiety and it allows them to know. Cause also too, like anything with a child, like if you tell them you can't have something, you're going to, you're going to want it more. So I'm all, I'm a big believer in like, it's all out on the table unless you're allergic or, you know, it causes a severe intolerance of some sort, but it's all, it all fits. And, and now how do we navigate it? You know, it was really interesting as a coach and as a content creator, because I got a lot of messages from people being like, listen, I've followed you for literally years. And I've seen you talking about the importance of calories. I've seen you write about it in your Instagram. I've seen you do it in videos, in podcasts, in your email newsletter, on Twitter, on Facebook, everywhere for years. But you have to understand, it's not just your content I'm seeing. I'm also seeing mm. the people who are saying keto is the only way. And there are people who are saying who's plant-based is the only way. And people are saying paleo is the only way. And so even though I've seen you say it for years, I didn't really believe it until I saw you do this. Mm. That is really what was the switch for thousands of people. And it's like thousands of people. It was like, it was a huge lesson as a coach. And for me, one thing I've been encouraging a lot of coaches to do is do your own challenge like this. Like mm. do it for your clients, do it for your family members, do it for your audience, like do it for, for your colleagues, do it for whoever, because you can say it all you want. Right. but it doesn't mean anything unless they actually believe it. And that's really what this is all about. Like you can tell them you can have all the knowledge in the world, but knowledge without practical application is, is bullshit. It doesn't matter. Right. And if you're not going to apply it, what's the point? Yeah. Yeah. And also you went first. <laughs> <laughs> it was funny. I think a lot of coaches were like, Oh my God, I hope he doesn't fuck up. <laughs> like, in front of a lot of people i hope he doesn't fuck up and it was funny yeah. because the first three days i didn't take it seriously like i didn't in terms of my like uh do you know who max tuning is yeah I, is it is he related to chase tuning yeah 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 so yeah chase is on chase i work i've worked with before he's on my podcast as well and claire is a good friend of mine Your family it. is like great yeah yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so max was launching his his new candy and he sent me his candy and I was eating that. And I, I wasn't really moderating my calories enough the first few days. And then like three days go in and I was like, there's a lot of people watching this. Like I need to get my shit together mm -hmm. because if I hadn't, if I had gained weight over those 30 days, people would have been like, no shit, Sherlock, you ate a Big Mac every day. If I had just stayed exactly the same and didn't lose weight, people would have been like, you didn't prove anything. Mm -hmm. I had to lose weight in order for people to really like to make this click. So I, that meant I had to get my calories in check. I had to make sure that my nutrition was dialed in so that I can include that Big Mac every single day and show people that you can still lose fat in the process. Yeah. So let's get into that, do the details of it. So, um, you use, I'm assuming, like, just tell us what you did. How did you track? Did you use like a specific app? Um, what did you have your calories at? Um, and then other than the Big Mac, what else, what other types of food did you eat and what were your activity levels like? So, I will, I'll preface by saying all of it, like in outrageous detail is in the YouTube video. If you like, you want to see literally like an hour long video, of like every, like a lot of my meals, my exercise routine, it's all there. Um, what I will say, and I want to also make this clear is I've tracked calories since I was a teenager. Mm -hmm. Like, and by that, I mean, I started doing it when I was a teenager. So now I don't have to. Oh, interesting. So you okay. didn't track at all. You didn't I document. Didn't, I didn't weigh my food. I, okay. didn't, I, didn't it. I, I would assume you did. I didn't mainly just because I did it so meticulously for several years. I don't really have to anymore just because, sure. you know, it's like yeah. when you, and that's why I'm so adamant about people doing it for at least 30 days, mm -hmm. like just weigh everything you eat for 30 days. Yeah. You don't, you don't have to continue doing it, but just doing it for that amount of time will be like, Oh shit. Like, that's what actually a tablespoon of, of cream looks like. Oh, that's actually what like a serving of almonds looks like. Oh shit. Like that. And it, it's sometimes just that, which is enough to really to make you understand, okay, I'm literally eating double what I thought. Yeah. And occasionally what I'll do is maybe like once or twice a year, I'll track for a week just to jog my memory and make sure. Okay. Yeah. But yeah. so for the challenge, I didn't weigh and measure my food. 
But I can tell you probably within about 100 to 150 calories that I was about, I was eating about 1500 a day, uh, 1500 calories on a daily basis. And keeping in mind, I'm only like five foot four. Right. So that number, yeah, guys, everyone's individual needs are so different. But if you could give maybe a reference of like a caloric deficit, what you're maybe. So so I was, um, I was eating about 1500 and I was walking around 10,000 steps a day. Mm -hmm. So approximately probably about like a 700 calorie deficit per day around there, uh, which is significant. Like if I was taking on a client and I was putting someone who's already like around my level of leanness, uh, on into a deficit, it would probably be closer to like 300 to 400 a day, like to start depending on where they needed. So I was, I was about double that, um, again, deliberately so they could really show that this works. Right. And I think it's also really important to remember, like I lost seven pounds in a month. That's about double the progress of what I would consider really, really sustainable if you're doing this for your life. What I did with- Yeah, with your leanness, because you're super lean. I'm I'm lean. I have a fair amount of muscle mass. Going that quickly, you're asking number one to lose muscle. Number two is a lot of times your energy will dip your strength will dip. Uh, and the more quickly you go, the more lean you are, the more likely you are to binge and regain it all as a result. So the more body fat you have, the more quickly you can go. But as you get leaner and leaner and leaner, personally, I recommend half a pound to a pound a week on average. So like at the end of two months, if you've only lost four pounds, that's not only four pounds, that's four fucking pounds. That's amazing. Yeah. A lot of people don't look at it like that. So that's why I really, I want to clarify, I lost seven pounds, but I'm very experienced with this. I've been doing this for years and years and years. And it's sort of like comparing someone who's like an elite athlete to the middle school version. If you've never really tracked your calories meticulously, and if you haven't really done it for a long period of time, then you can't expect the same, like to, to have as a uh, level of expertise as me. And that's really what I want to put out there just so people know it's like, it takes time and practice. I appreciate that. Thank you for saying that. I think that's very important for sure. Um, but it's also really refreshing to know that you actually didn't even track. I mean, like, cause if you have some background of knowledge and that's actually what, that's exactly what I teach my clients is in the beginning, it's a lot of tracking, a lot of awareness. It's like always on your brain, but it's to get you to the point of not having to think about it, not having to measure, not even not having to stress because it's just so who you are. And you're just, so you know what foods agree with you, you know, your proper portions that are individualized to you. And you've had years of that to already have as like a solid base. So now this came into play and it was a lot easier for you to adhere to. You know, it's, I love the way you're framing it. And, and I agree with you hundred percent. And I think a lot of people struggle. A lot of people are, are fed this propaganda nonsense about calorie counting. They're like, Oh, like it, it's going to be so difficult and so time consuming. It's like, is tracking your finances very difficult and time consuming? It's like when you first start learning about the different type, types of, of investments and finances and bank accounts, like, yeah, it's a little bit overwhelming. And it's like, I don't, it's like, but you don't just not do it because it's difficult in the first month. It's like you fucking figure it out. You sit down, you do it. And then you, you sort of master it over time and you can, you don't have to track every single penny going in and out of every single transaction of your bank account. You don't want to do that or else you're going to have a disordered relationship with your finances. But you, you build up that relationship. You know how much is generally in there. You know how much you're putting in. You know how much you're taking out on a general basis. And then over time, you're more intuitive with it. Same thing with your calories. It's like initially, you spend a significant amount of time researching, Googling. How many calories are in this food? How many calories are in this food? What's a serving size look like? Da, 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 da. And then after a month, two months, three months, you don't have to Google it anymore. You don't have to check your app anymore because you've done it so many times. Right. Right. Okay. So, um, you mentioned you walked 10,000 steps a day. You had a Big Mac. Did you have fries too? I'm glad you asked. I had fries on the last day as a congratulations, but one of the major themes throughout the video and, and this was going directly in, in the face of supersize me and supersize me. He had to say yes. Every time they asked him to supersize it, Mm. that was the rule. If they ask you to supersize it, you have to say yes. And I'm like, are you not a fucking adult? Mm -hmm. You can't say no, thank you. So there were a number of times throughout the, the mini, like 
literally ordering several times where they would say, do you want the, the meal? Do you want the fries? And when we were doing it, they have these like computer screens where like, they'll ask you two or three times before you check out, if you want to add fries, or if you want to add something else to it. And literally I'd look at the camera and be like, no, just a sandwich. Cause I'm an adult. I can make this decision. This is myself. It's like, I fucking hated how narrative driven that documentary was from the perspective of giving people this, this false idea that you have to have the biggest, most calorie dense, most like option there. Like you can choose whatever the fuck you want. Number one. And number two is even if you do get the most calorie dense one, it's like, you don't have to eat there every meal, every single day. And you are under no obligation to anyone but yourself to do what you want to do. Mm. That is such a powerful lesson. Thank you so much. I literally, you're, I was just like, yes, yes, yes. Because last night, my entire conversation with a new client of mine was saying how like she's she had this injury and people have been like bringing her food. And so we had to talk about like saying no, thank you. I appreciate you offering this. Um, but, you know, it doesn't it doesn't align with my goals or I already ate. And like, no one, you know, you really need to be your own advocate and know you are in control of your food choices at all times. And I think it's more about creating that healthy relationship and knowing that you're in control in a healthy way, not in a restrictive way, or just like a, you know, I'm just going to eat because I'm upset sort of a way, but finding the control in a balanced way that makes sense for you. So you can genuinely enjoy foods like a Big Mac or ice cream or French fries, whatever your choice is, but doing it in a way that doesn't make you feel like bloated or sluggish or extremely just like maybe upset with yourself and it aligns with like your, all of your values. Yeah. And it's interesting there were several things I learned from the challenge that I didn't expect. And this was really one of the points that really hit home where a lot of people, if they go to McDonald's or if they go get some ice cream or if they go to get a pizza immediately, just because they're doing that, they feel anxiety and they feel guilty and they feel like they're fucking up. Mm. And because of that, they go for the largest option. They go for the biggest one because the emotional response is, well, I'm screwing up anyway, which means I'm not going to have this again for a long time. And because of that, I'm going to have the biggest one go all out, huge bang, essentially binge. Mm -hmm. And then I'll get back on track tomorrow where it's like, or you could know this isn't anything bad. You're not screwing anything up, have an appropriate portion size and then get right back on track your next meal. Like don't use this as an excuse or justification to binge or, or, or quit or give up. Just like, you're an adult mm-hmm. Have an appropriate portion size of that ice cream bowl. Right. So, or if you want to eat the whole fucking pint, that's fine. Probably not the best to do on a consistent basis. If you are concerned with your body composition, but if you want to have the whole pint, then get back on track. But these, these feelings of guilt and shame are what we have to eliminate because when you have that guilt or shame or feeling of failure, that's when you use that justification of, well, fuck, whatever. I'm just going to keep going and binging and binging. And you know what? I already had the pizza, so I'm going to have the cinnamon toast crunch. I had the cinnamon toast crunch, so I'm going to have the cake. I have the cake. Well, I'm going to go have this. And that's when it adds up and adds up and adds up. And then they go see the scale. They gain seven pounds, which obviously because you just ate a fuck ton, it's like it's not seven pounds of fat. You just obviously you ate a fuck ton. So now it's like one thing leads to another where then they give up. And like, well, the diet was too restricted. The diet was too this. The diet was too that. It's like, no, no, no. You used the justification of failing. You used that failing as a justification to quit. Whereas if you just had an appropriate portion size and got back on track, mm. you've been totally fine. Totally. Totally. Yeah. Oh my gosh. This is so great. Um, I'm curious. Did you get tired of the Big Mac? Mm-hmm. I hate you it. Did, right. Cause you had it every day. And I think that's also to show it's like, if we don't restrict and you let yourself have it, like eventually you're not going to want it. It's not going to be on this pedestal. So many times certain foods are put on a pedestal and it's just food. That's it. Food. it so funny. By the third day I was like, yeah, I really don't want it anymore. Um, they tasted great the whole time, but they're small and they're 540 calories per and I was eating about 1500 calories a day. So it's like a third of my calories. Wow. So it's like, that doesn't leave me too much wiggle room. And it's so funny. The entire time I kept telling Rico, my videographer, I was like, man, when this is done, I'm going to get pizza. Like I want fucking pizza. As soon as it was done, the first thing I did is I got the, uh, just the fries with it for my last one. And I didn't want the pizza anymore Mm -hmm. because we, we think about what we want, what we want, what we want. And then as soon as you just 
you appro- you moderately indulge rather than binging, mm-hmm. you can have a more appropriate relationship with your food. It's these yeah. it's these extreme ends that we fall on. Either I'm not going to have it ever at all because I'm very strict and rigid, or I'm going to have as much of it as I possibly can. I'm going to eat until the point where I want to throw up. Like, where's the middle ground? Like, mm-hmm. let's let's do this. It's way better here. It's a way better life. You can indulge more frequently and continue to make more progress without the negative side effects. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, were you hungry? I'm curious. Yeah. You, yeah, I was gonna say, like, how did you, like, what did you do to manage your hunger cues? Because I feel like if you're right, like, a third of your calories are coming from a Big Mac that has very almost to no fiber, probably. Maybe like yeah, I actually don't know the fiber content. Uh, Can't be much. What like I mean, meat it doesn't have any. Bread doesn't have like white bread doesn't have any lettuce and tomato. Maybe like a two grams. <laughs> Maybe the sesame seeds on the bun. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, not, not much, but it was. And this was another unexpected benefit of the challenge. It, it's so funny. Throughout the challenge, there were a handful of people who were like, "You're promoting McDonald's and unhealthy eating." And I was like, "That's actually not what I'm promoting at all." And I'm outright saying. Don't do this. I'm not telling anyone to do this. This isn't healthy. I'm doing this as an experiment. Please don't do this. Don't do this. Not a good idea. Don't do this. I said that a million yeah. times. But what ended up happening as a result now is what I when I showed what else I was eating, I showed them that every day I was having what I call a big ass salad, a be like a big ass salad every day. And it's so funny as a coach, we always tell people like have more fruits and veggies, have more fruits and veggies, and everyone fucking knows eat more fruits and veggies. But when a lot of people tell me like yeah, every time I'm in a calorie deficit, I'm just, I'm so hungry. And I'm like, how many salads are you eating a week? And they're like, Oh, mm-hmm. like two, which really means none. And then, so instead of just saying eat more fruits and veggies, I've been saying have one big ass salad every day. Mm-hmm. And people are like, Oh my God, I feel way more full. It's like, yeah, no shit. Because you're filling yourself up with a ton of vegetables and that's fantastic. So as from a coaching perspective, being more specific with it, but that was without question one of the best things that I was able to do in order to stay full longer is just have a fucking huge salad every day. Mm-hmm. Totally. And I'm sure you drink lots of water. Tons of water. Yeah. <laughs> the only way to stay full. <laughs> a lot of sparkling water. Yeah. Yeah. So, all right. Well, looking back on it now, um, would you do it again? Absolutely. I'm, I have other challenges uh, in the works right now. Yeah? I mean, yeah, yeah. Are you allowed to tell us or no? No, they got to be a secret. Okay. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to do a fat loss one for a while because that was probably one of the hardest parts of it for me was I didn't want to lose fat when I started. Oh, yeah. And did you, a uh, question, did you gain any weight back? Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah. So but- I, I've been in a muscle gain phase for the last, like, challenge aside for the last, like, five or six months because I've been focusing on building more muscle and Mm -hmm. I hired a coach. Like I was like, I really want to focus on this Mm -hmm. because my whole career was based around, especially as a competitive power lifter and a wrestler getting stronger without getting bigger Mm -hmm. to improve my performance without gaining size. I was like, I actually want to try and gain size now so I can have some opinions on that and and learn about it. Mm -hmm. So when I started the challenge, I, uh, I actually didn't want to lose fat from my own personal goals perspective, but I had to for this, which like, so I had to go into a deficit and my training like changed a little bit. Like it wasn't as fun and I had a, a little bit less energy. So as soon as the challenge was over, I was like, fuck it. We're going right back into a surplus. We're going. So yeah, I absolutely for sure. But it was, it was the goal. Like I didn't, I think too many people focus on fat loss for too long. Yeah. To the point where it's like all they focus on is fat loss all day, every day, over and over and over again. And then they end up binging and then they end up not liking how they look and their strength isn't where they want it to be. And they're tired. It's like, listen, you can't only focus on fat loss forever and ever and ever and expect to be happy because that is a never ending path to unhappiness and un- like not being fulfilled. And when your only goal is fat loss, what a narrow path you got yourself down. Like there's so many other things you can focus on. Uh, like, there's so many other options outside of just balance. It's like, and I, that's one of the, so we'll be doing other challenges, muscle gain challenges. And, and, and the next one is to do with coffee. And I don't want to give too much away just yet. Don't, don't, don't break my heart. I am. I have a mild addiction to coffee. Like it's, <laughs> I don't want to give away, but if it goes the way the research points that it's going to go, then it will be very much in support of coffee. Okay. Good. 
Yeah. So, okay. So there's slight bias, but that's fine. Like same thing, like your intention before the big back challenge, you did have a a goal to kind of prove, but you also weren't going to be screwing with it and just to get a certain result, but you do, it's like any experiment you go on with a hypothesis with a belief of how you would like it, you expect it to turn out, but you're not going to make it turn out a certain way. Of course. And not to mention if you watch the challenge, number one is like, I was very open and forthright about like, I had more diarrhea than usual. Like, they didn't make me feel good. It wasn't oh, like wow. I was like super excited about having a Big Mac. And I was very honest about that. The point wasn't to glamorize McDonald's or the Big Mac. And the point wasn't to say like, supersize me said never eat it. I'm saying always eat it. I'm saying supersize me fed you a bullshit narrative, creating more fear and anxiety around food. And I'm saying you can have it in moderation without being fearful of it. Don't emphasize it, but also don't demonize it. Totally. So for this next challenge... Obviously, I have a bias around coffee, but I'm also bringing in a doctor to run the tests and labs on me for it. Mm-hmm. So, like, I will literally stay at the doctor's house for 48 hours straight doing whatever the doctor says for me to do, and they'll run the labs. And I'm just the guinea pig. Like, I'm the lab rat. So, like, yeah, I have a bias, but whatever the fucking doctor reads, like, that's that's the labs. Right, right. Ooh, I'm excited. <laughs> wow. I'm really excited. Um, so, I, okay. So I want to be mindful of your time. Um, but I also want to make sure I like get a lot enough out of this. So, um, hmm, I, don't know. I don't know. Is there anything you feel like the listeners need to know or any kind of like last minute conversations or topics you want to share? Oh, there's so much. There's so- Can I ask a personal question? Absolutely not. How dare you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you, I'm a, you do like speaking engagements, right? Yep. Absolutely. How did you get into that? Cause I am like, that's like my next career goal is to mm-hmm. do, I want to be a paid public speaker. Have you, let me ask you that. So it's a great question. And it's Rico, my videographer is like, he has ears perked up as soon as you said that. Cause that's been my main goal. For I also life. need more videographies, vide- videographies, more videographers. If you want, <laughs> yeah, I'm in New York. <laughs> like, <laughs> I just hired somebody else, but I need someone that's like available all the time, but he's with you all the time. So that wouldn't work. But he has friends. Rico and I are attached by the hip. So like, we're, 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 they're the same at this point. Like we're the same. Um, so let me ask you this. Have you tried doing any speaking engagements? Yeah. So I do. Well, I do a lot of them for free. I get paid for some. I just got, a, I just got a TEDx deal. I'm going to be that's on amazing. TEDx in February. Where? Um, in Wisconsin. That's amazing. <laughs> That's yeah. incredible. Hey, so what the fuck are you asking me for? You sounds like you're doing great. Well, yeah, but that's not, obviously that's not paid as exposure, but I guess like, I, I don't know. I guess I'm just curious. Like I want to just know more about your journey so I can get inspired and, and just you, remember. Literally it. it's like, I, I think you're probably second guessing yourself when you shouldn't like how, how, for how many either weeks or months or years have you been really chasing the speaking gigs? So that's the thing. It's kind of on and off because of the fact that like I just, so February of this year, I am doing my business full time. So my main thing is just building up my client load, which I am pretty much almost at cap with. And now I'm going to start creating a course, which congrats. Hi guys, I'm creating a course. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And then I kind of want to have those two things kind of under wraps and like, just like as two options that I could always offer and then do more speaking. So, and so since February is when you've been doing more speaking since, so for like, no, oh yeah. So to answer your question, it's been off and on and it kind of put it on hold because I've been building my client load and just doing my business full time. So I haven't really been going after paid speaking gigs so much. I more or less just, um, if they come across my way. Got it. So, I mean, literally I'm going to reframe the question. Like one of your clients, like, yeah, like let's say, how did, how did you get so lean? Like, how did you get a six pack? It's like, well, you know, I was super consistent with it and I was whatever. It's like, what about you? Well, you know, I was doing it in February, but then I went off and on for a while and da, da, da. it's like, oh, but by the way, like there was one point in time when I did have a six pack. It's like, you have a fucking TEDx gig. Like you are like, even when you're not going after a hundred percent, you're still getting gigs. I have a feeling that you're shortchanging yourself and you're like not even realizing how incredible it is what you're doing. And if you really fucking go all in on it and chase them, then you'll get them. I think really for me, the biggest thing that's helped me get more speaking gigs is going here and being like, Hey, I'm doing speaking gigs. 
like consistently yeah. and, and doing a lot of them for free yeah. until more and more came and more and more came and more and more came. And then like, I, I like doing them. So oh, I love it. It's like lights me up. That's why I know it's like what I want to do. Yeah. So for the first several, like I did them for free. I, I funded my travel. I, I, I didn't charge them anything. One of them, even they offered to pay me and I went there and I was like, hey, honestly, I don't even want your money. Like I just like, I just like doing it. Now it's getting to a point where like it has to happen either because travel is crazy or just like it's, it has to happen, but consistently putting it out there and showing people that I'm doing it and that I love doing it has been the number one way that people have continued to reach out for me for it. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you for that because I also know, so I have a lot of people like that, that listen to the podcast that are just trying to get healthy, but I also have a lot of dietitians, um, nutrition coaches, people that are like, want to progress in, um, and make this their full-time business. So I know that so many people just got a lot out of what you just said. So thank you very much. And it's the same thing for people who want to grow their social media, but they're not fucking posting on social media every day. Right. It's like, they're like, well, I want to post on social media, but I also don't want it to take over my life. It's like, okay, so like, right. What do you want? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Going back to, and it all comes full circle from the beginning, right? Like finding that, that quote unquote balance. It's like, no, where do you, what do you want? <laughs> People are so quick to be like, aren't like, are you addicted to your phone? Like you're just at your phone all day. It's like, I don't know. Are you addicted to your desk? You're at your desk all fucking day. That's so true. You know what I mean? It's like, what are you using to be addicted? Like I would rather be here interacting with hundreds of thousands of people than at my desk looking at what someone else is doing. Yeah. Like, you know, choose your addiction. So true. So true. Oh my gosh. Well, I don't want to end, but we have to end. <laughs> Where can people find you? Um, Instagram, that YouTube video you were talking about. How do people get in touch with you? Do you have anything going on also? Is there anything that you want? Like, to I'm super boring. Or Nothing going on. <laughs> uh, my name's Jordan Syatt, S-Y-A-T-T. I have my own podcast, the Jordan Syatt mini podcast, and uh, YouTube, Jordan Syatt, just J-O-R-D-A-N-S-Y-A-T-T. And uh, if you put that name into Google, you'll find a whole bunch. So that, that's pretty much it. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Jordan. This has been an absolute pleasure. And I really hope, I didn't know you were in New York, so we have to get together. Yeah, let's get coffee or something. I would love that. I would love that. All that right. Talk good. to you soon. Bye. Wow, was that not another amazing episode? If you enjoyed that episode, please screenshot this, share it on your story, tag me, tag Jordan. Let us know that this is something that helped change the way that you view food and healed you or helped you as a result. If you have any additional questions, please don't hesitate to email me, tipsatoni at gmail.com. And Jordan is very responsive in the DMs. If you want to send him a message, I know he would appreciate it. And if you're not already following him on Instagram or YouTube, you definitely want to. He has a really great way of teaching you while also entertaining you, um, hitting you in the heart when you need it, but also um, giving you the, you know, the fun side to it all and really making nutrition and fitness really easy to follow, to stick to so you can enjoy the rest of your life. So his message is aligned with uh, mine. And so I'd really appreciate it if you guys could follow him and read more and take more of that stuff rather than some of the other people that we see on Instagram. <laughs> Not going to say who, but, you know, make sure you're following legit accounts. Right? Um, anyways, guys, I really, really appreciate you tuning in. If you're not already subscribed to the podcast, please subscribe. It allows you to be notified when a new episode comes out every Monday and every Wednesday. And if you feel super inspired, super intrigued, and you want to rate this episode, feel free to rate it, write a review. I really, really appreciate it. It allows other people to find the podcast, which means more people get to hear this very important message. All right, guys, that is it for me today. As always, thank you so much for listening. This is Tony Marinucci, your registered dietitian, helping you get healthy one bite at a time.